it's very important for reporters to speak to professors and researchers at universities. They provide context, whether it's historical context or whether we need to speak to an economist about something or perhaps speak to somebody who has been researching you know, uh, Chinese top political leadership transitions for many, many years. So academics provide context. And I would add that in many ways, viewers or readers have been conflating the two as more academics go online and start blogging. Uh, there is some confusion between who is a journalist or who is a professor when they're looking at the byline. It doesn't mean anything to the average consumer. So that's been an interesting development, but I do think that the two roles are fundamentally different. As a journalist, we approach academics and speak to them. Sometimes I'm busy speaking to somebody a few times a week to better understand an issue. But the value added from journalists is that we are on the ground. Sometimes the academic I talk to isn't even in China. He or she could well be in Wisconsin. And they've spent many years studying one issue, but the value added again it, for journalists is that we are on the ground. We are there every single day. So I believe that there is a fundamental difference when someone is in China daily getting a gut feeling about what's going on on current events. And that's the value that journalists do bring, and I think that's where the difference lies. I think we have to be very careful about connecting the dots between what journalists do and how it affects state policy in China. We simply don't know and we can't really fact check that to see that Zhong Nanghai has responded one way or the other because of what reporters have done. It's certainly tempting to look at something such as what um, the New York Times and Bloomberg has done over the past 12 to 18 months and their follow the money sort of investigation of China's top political leadership and um, how I believe it was the New York Times that found that Wen Jiabao's extended family had a value of some two billion US dollars. Whether that information and report when it came out affected the Hu Wen team's ability to go after Bo Xi Lai, or whether Wen Jiabao lost political capital as a result, but again, we really don't know, right? I mean, it's tempting to think so, but I think we have to be very careful to presume that foreign correspondence work does affect state policy. I would say it's a little bit more clear when foreign reporters put out a story and it affects policy or the discussion in a country that is not China, such as the United States. And you, we can see that with the New York Times story or set of stories on hackers purportedly from China that broke into the New York Times system, but also other American companies. And suddenly there was a national debate in the United States, despite the fact that there is suggestion that the U.S. government had known about these hacking cases for some time and was responding internally to it. Uh, this became a public debate where the Obama administration and other officials in the U.S. government felt that they had to uh, answer or say something about it publicly. So I think that's where it's far easier to look at the New York Times or Bloomberg or any other foreign organization's work and say, oh, look, you know, now the U.S. government is really talking about it, or the people of the United States are concerned and want their government to do something about it. We can see that uh, from A to B to C far more clearly, and certainly with China's case, we just don't know what happens behind the doors of Zhong Nanhai. It's very interesting to see how the media landscape has changed for foreign correspondents over the past four or five years. I arrived in China ahead of the Olympics, and at that time, you can say that China was on its best behavior. Uh, they had a lot of great expectations for the Olympic Games. There was a lot of attention on how China was behaving. Uh, Twitter, Facebook was not blocked at that time. And there were tons of new journalists coming into the country to try to understand what was happening in China. And the thing that I always said and believed was that it's not very important what's happening now. What's going to be interesting is what happens after the party is over, after the games. And I think that's been very much borne out if you look at the kind of two steps back attitude that the Chinese government has had vis-a-vis -vis foreign correspondence. It's become harder 
more you know online web pages are blocked Twitter Facebook Gmail sometimes it's very hard to use a proxy or VPN to get onto websites the New York Times is blocked now so you know from the Olympics onwards it's sort of been a downhill move for foreign correspondents what we're seeing today is a lot of state-backed media organizations, whether it is Al Jazeera or CCTV, but also France 24 and Russia Today. And what I would say about Al Jazeera and credibility versus CCTV is that Al Jazeera regularly invites Israeli government spokespeople onto our channel. And they accept the invitation and there is a Q&A with the presenter until the day CCTV invites the Dalai Lama onto their news channel, I think we need to withhold judgment on CCTV. When they do invite the Dalai Lama, I think then we should start taking that channel very seriously.